I'm Ken Ben Muller. Grace and Jeffrey have asked me to speak on the topic of from ERCP to EDGE. And what I've done is assembled uh, what I consider milestone landmark papers that chronicle this evolution of ERCP to EDGE. And so uh, I'll review those papers with you today. Now, this is actually not the full title that Grace and Jeffrey gave me. The full title is The Extinction of Biliary Surgery. And that word extinction does sound a bit harsh, but I have to admit that we have seen a continual replacement of GI surgery by endoscopic innovation as in the uh, session title. That evolution has been one from complementary to competitive because the historic role of endoscopy was complementary. And I characterize this as the three Ps. First, prevention, as exemplified by polypectomy. Second, palliation, as exemplified by stenting. And third, the prohibitive risk, surgical risk, patient. The evolving role of endoscopy is becoming increasingly competitive. This is exemplified by ESD. And now we're performing full thickness resections. Third space endoscopy, the pollen procedure in all parts of the GI tract. And finally, EUS guided interventions, which I'm going to focus on today. Therapeutic ERCP has been mostly complementary. It's been, for the most part, what David Fleischer called clogology, unclogging the obstructed or blocked duct lumen. It can be stones using baskets and balloons or strictures, dilate, ablate, or stent. It can be closing holes, mostly with stents, but we've also used glues. And if we look at the evolution of ERCP over some three decades, starting back in 1968, you can see these landmark advances, but it pretty much ended here with sphincteroplasty in 1995. Quietly in the background, endoscopic ultrasonography was emerging and de Magno at the Mayo Clinic reported the first EUS procedure uh, using the NECO endoscope that was actually manufactured by an American company, ACMI, and reported this in animals. I think it was dogs, but it quickly then went to humans. And in the 80s, endoscopic ultrasound disseminated as an imaging procedure using the radial scanning echoendoscope. It then evolved to an interventional procedure with the advent of the curved linear ray echoendoscope. You can see the needle now in the ultrasound imaging plane, and then evolved to therapy in the new millennium with our ability to place stents. The birth of notes was actually in 1992. Peter Villman, reported the first EUS-guided FNA as a new method, new materials report, and he used a self-manufactured uh, continuous metal needle inside of a five French Teflon a sheath to sample various tissues with insufficient material and only 15% using a CLA echoendoscope. Now that we could target lesions outside the gastrointestinal tract and sample those lesions, we could do the reverse of aspiration. We could inject. And Moritz Wiersema reported on the first EUS guided cholangiopancreatography, 1996. These are these stunning images where he's creating a cholangiogram that rivals what we produce with ERCP, but with the additional ability to see everything also under uh, ultrasound. 
Riersama accomplished EOS guided cholangiopancreatography using various routes of access, transgastric, transhepatic, or transduodenal to access the bile duct and to access the pancreatic duct, transgastric, and transduodenal. So what we see is a convergence of EOS and ERCP in 1996. And a few years later, Sean Mallory reported the first rendezvous ERCP, six patients who failed ERCP using an FNA needle to access the bile or pancreatic duct. Then after injection, passing a wire anterogradely across the ampulla and then switching out the echoendoscope for a duodenoscope to perform ERCP. In 1992, my colleagues and I in Hamburg, Germany, working in Nib Sanders department, performed the first EOS guided cyst enterostomy, drainage of a pseudocyst that was non bulging. And we reported this as a case report using a prototype pervlinary echoendoscope. It had a very small channel, only two millimeters. So we had to switch out for a duodenoscope to place a stent. We used a self-fashioned continuous diathermic needle passed through a five French Cephalon catheter. And after exchanging out for the duodenoscope, place the stent to drain the pseudocyst. So with this, EOS guided therapy was born and we were using the Seldinger technique developed by radiologist Sven Seldinger, an over the guide wire technique consisting of four steps, needle puncture, placing a wire, dilating the tract or priming it for therapy, in this case, stent placement. And using this Seldinger technique, Mark Giovannini from France reported in 2001, the first colodoco enterostomy. It's a case report, patient with obstructive jaundice with failed ERCP, performed transduodenal CBD puncture past a guide wire, and then using the Seldinger technique, performed bougie dilation over the wire to prime the tract for placement of a 10 French plastic stent using a duodenoscope. But he commented in his report that the main problem is the risk of leakage of bile into the peritoneum. Pancreatical enterostomy was reported a year later in four patients who had failed ERCP needing pancreatic duct drainage for painful chronic pancreatitis. They used a 6.5 French cystitone to access the PD, then placed a wire and placed after that a six or seven French plastic stent. Now that was all done with one scope, with the echoendoscope, because by this time we had echoendoscopes with larger channels. They commented on why they used a cystitone to access the PD and the need for special devices with cautery to enable passage through fibrotic pancreatic parenchyma. Colocystoenterostomy was reported by Todd Barron, then at the Mayo Clinic in 2007. A case report in a patient with acute cholecystitis after biliary SEMS blocking the cystic duct. They were not able to cannulate the gallbladder for drainage transpapillary so they performed transduodenal gallbladder drainage using the Seldinger technique. When we perform transluminal drainage therapy, we are creating an intentional perforation. So in the case of gallbladder drainage, for example, we're creating a hole in the bowel wall, duodenum, or the stomach, and the gallbladder. The gallbladder is normally not adherent to the bowel wall. And on EUS, there is a bright echogenic layer between the bowel and the gallbladder. This is fat tissue. This significant risk of leak 
which I personally experience many times using the Seldinger technique to drain various cavities outside the GI tract into the bowel lumen, inspired me to develop the LAMS, the Lumen Opposing Metal Stent. In 2011, I reported on creation of a LAMS anastomosis for the drainage of non-adherent extraintestinal fluid collection. So this was proof of concept in animals to hold two lumens in that position, essentially equivalent to a surgical anastomosis that seals and tamponades and provides a port for us to pass our endoscope for transluminal endoscopy for interventions outside the gastrointestinal tracts. So essentially enabling a notes procedure. The first in human study was published in 2012. The procedures were performed in Japan with Takao Itoi, 15 patients, 10 pseudocysts, five gallbladders, with high technical and clinical success rate and transluminal interventions in seven patients without complications. The stents could be removed without complication. In the same year, pushing this LAMS frontier further, in the animal model, the first LAMS gastroenterostomy was reported. Here you can see images of the hot puncture of a loop of small intestine, followed by deployment of the LAMS. Here's the distal anchor, the flange, and the proximal flange. And here you can see the LAMS anastomosis with the afferent and efferent limbs created. And on necropsy, you see the stomach and the jejunum in apposition. Will EUS-guided gastroenterostomy one day replace surgical gastroenterostomy? This will, of course, require randomized controlled trials, well-designed. We do have a systemic review and meta-analysis of several retrospective studies comparing EOS-guided gastroenterostomy with surgical. And we see here that in terms of clinical success, the two are comparable, slightly favoring EUS-guided gastroenterostomy. Uh, no significant difference between the two groups, though. However, what was significantly different were the adverse events, whereby surgery had a significantly higher adverse event rate. Could EUS-guided anastomoses replace surgery for benign disease? I don't think there's any argument that for palliation of malignant disease, EUS-guided treatment is appropriate. What about benign disease? I think three questions will need to be sufficiently answered. What is the durability of endoscopic anastomoses? What are the long-term adverse events and effects? And what is the impact on future surgery if needed? We certainly do not want to burn any bridges to surgery. In 2015, Michelle Cahela and his group reported on the EDGE procedure. So this is either a gastro gastrostomy or a jejunal gastrostomy in a patient post gastric bypass. It enables the endoscopist to directly access the patient's native stomach to perform ERCP in the usual uh, fashion. So the LAMS serves as a port to pass the duodenoscope into the native uh, stomach. And he reported this in uh, five patients post-gastric bypass with good success rates, some issues with LAMS dislodgement, uh, and this has become more refined. Uh, we uh, have seen uh, many more reports of the EDGE procedure, and now we have a LAMS with a larger lumen diameter of 20 millimeters to reduce the risk of LAMS dislodgement. The evolution of ERCP to EDGE is really the evolution of the transluminal anastomosis. It started 
three decades ago in 1992 with the first cyst enterostomy. Creation of an anastomosis had always been the domain for surgery. And over these three decades, endoscopists have been able to progressively encroach on this uh, domain. And it's really the introduction of the LAMS in 2011 that catapulted our progress because now we could more safely create this anastomosis, almost inconceivable to create a gastroenterostomy or a gastrogastrostomy without a LAMS, at least in terms of uh, safety. So now I'll circle back to the title for this session and for my talk. There's no question that we have incrementally replaced biliary surgery with the convergence of ERCP and EUS. Is biliary surgery headed for extinction? Well, that becomes a possibility with our ability to create a safe anastomoses with the lambs. Thank you very much.